now going to turn it over to David Weinberger and Colin McClay, who will do a summary and lead our closing session. Summary. Well, okay, no summary. Or perhaps take us in a completely different direction. Yeah, let's correct that. We will not do the summary. You all will do the summary. band. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, uh, well, that is loud. Um, I'm David Weinberger. I'm at the Berkman Center. I'm also at the uh, Harvard Library Innovation Lab. And my name is Colin McClay. I'm uh, Managing Director of the Berkman Center. So, um, I suspect that many of us are sort of, we've wrapped up mentally. Is that I, I, this was a very uh, intense and interesting day, and <clears throat> I'm feeling pretty much topped out intellectually, but we'll spend a, a, a few minutes, if you don't mind, on, um, this, on a couple of questions. And so one of the questions we thought that we would ask you, because we don't have a summary between us, uh, is over the course of this day, it was a long day, but it's obviously a huge, huge topic. What is it that has not come up or has not come up sufficiently that we should be talking about? Uh, especially if there's something that, as we say, you have on your chest that is sort of bothering you. Why didn't they talk about? What are the, what's the stuff that just didn't um, arise? Really? Uh, this is a not, not, I'm just more, uh, very more, much more interested in the issues just brought up about reliability, availability, and performance, and what happens during models of wartime and where things go down and um, governmental and civic collapse. I, it just raised a lot of interesting questions. For privacy and, uh, and publicness? Actually, I, would you mind saying, I'm sorry, Colin, but um, would you mind saying a little bit more about what interests you about that or where the that conversation, if we were to have it, should go? Uh, oh, uh, <laughs> where it should go? Um, I, I guess it's a longer conversation one person's utopia about machines is someone else's dystopia, so uh, I don't mean to make it philosophical, but I was interested in the last um, applications that were mentioned in the use of distribution of, of libraries and the distribution of hand tools for the youth, for children, and this kind of accumulative uh, po sense of possibility. Thank you. Other, other issues? We really covered everything today. There was nothing else that didn't get covered. I was interested in li uh, listening to so solutions, actually, the applicable solutions we could put into place in terms of the design of how do you do it. You know, all this privacy talk, like what kind of actual solutions we could do? Because the background is I'm trying to build a social network. Like, how would it be if I do it privacy by design from the beginning? So I was, I ran into a lot of design problems, and so I came here looking for actual solutions. So Do we have a request for free consulting from this group. Um, I mean, yeah, you know, that, that <clears throat> why don't we try this? Because I mean, that's a really uh, important question. Um, and as a way of organizing it, Harry, I'm, I am beginning to look at you. <coughs> if we did it in terms of the stack and ask, ask for example, we do it in terms of, of uh, Lessig's quadrants, which we might do. It's a very useful way of organizing. But if we did it in terms of the stack, is there stuff that we should be doing all the way down at the bottom of the stack in order to um, make privacy and publicness work better, whatever that means? And that's really a hard question. So. <laughs> <laughs> you, you yeah, can rephrase well, the, so, but, well, we'll let you think, I'll give you one, just one more second. So one way, one way would it do, to, be, to do it would be by stack, and another way would be to think about it by discipline, or what your respective discipline of computer science might contribute to that. You are the author I'm not, of, I'm not gonna be, I'm not the co-author of Blown I'm going to I'm gonna answer a different question. Excellent. Okay. Yeah, so, 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 I, so I, thought, I thought one of the things that, that, that was interesting, listening to Nick's comments here at the end, uh, in, uh, and, and clashing it up against the, uh, the dialogue between Ethan and uh, Tim Sparapana about, you know, so sorry, Ethan pointed out, and somebody I think pointed out before him, that we, we you know, the, the, um, 
the, the economics of this are really important, and, and we hit on it a couple of times today, but the, sort of the economics of, of privacy in particular as we, uh, as we're, uh, as, as we've, we've talked about it today are important, because we, we've, the, 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 the digital world is evolving in many ways away from the land of infinite diversity where every uh, special interest can go off by itself and have its own sub-community, which we've always thought of as being generative of great social progress. And, you know, a world where we've got to live with Facebook's rules or Google's worlds or Amazon's rules or, you know, whatever, whatever the monopoly, uh, you know, monopoly culture is. And I was very struck by that, and, and, and they're not necessarily rules they make up because they, they've become so, so, so big that they're regulated monopolies. And, and, um, but, the, the, but to listen to Nick talk about, on the other hand, that you know, if you want to make real progress in the world, you have to sort of put out of your mind anything that the market will take care of itself, I think really creates an, an interesting uh, 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 dialectic for us to think about about how the economics of the world are affecting the whole um, the whole space of uh, private and public spaces. Uh, so that, that's down the economic stack. So we'll, we'll accept that as an answer. That's fine. Uh, but I, so I don't want to push on the stack thing, but I do want to raise it because it gets to, um, for example, what was going on at the EG8, which some of you may have followed, and that uh, I know Jeff was at. I'm not sure other people here were at. Anybody else? Worse for you? Where there seems to be a fairly significant governmental, international governmental effort to regulate the internet towards more, uh, a more privacy uh, enforcement friendly uh, regime. So, I, I just, so I'll just put it in a marker for that, but there's a, a hand up. Is there a hand up? Yeah, I'll do that. You go. Let's hear this, and, and maybe, Phil, we could also ask you to take up uh, JP's challenge earlier in the day to expand upon it and talk about uh, the role of lawyers in this whole thing, please. And then we will get to design. <laughs> I just want to bring up something that um, was addressed earlier, and it's been going around on the Twitter feed, and I think a lot of people really want to hear more about this, um, the role of privilege and privacy. Um, Jane's comment earlier, um, I think that's something that we really need to talk about and how, um, especially how, you know, in certain communities that is really at risk and um, privacy, um, especially in the digital age, might be something that um, tends to be afforded um, only to those who have a great degree of access or have a great degree of knowledge. And um, I think that's a really valid point that's worth addressing. feeling David has a follow-up question to that. No, I do oh, not. you don't. I thought you were going to ask, is this the end of privacy? And uh, is that, is it even possible? No, it's a good question, though. <laughs> <laughs> um, does anyone want to take up the privilege question? We got three. And, Let's and go with Judith all first, all. since she doesn't have a job right now. Um. I think it's an enormous question because in a very everyday way as we see this, we see this with your, the ability to sell your privacy to get a discount at Stop and Shop. We certainly see it again in that distinction between how we see architectures. I think the glass house is a fascinating architecture because the glass houses that we see in, in the architecture magazines, we don't ever see them if we walk down the street because they're always hidden behind walls. They're hidden amongst acres and acres of weekend getaway land. Um, if you think about building glass houses for the poor, I forget the name, there was one architect who's in the unprivate house who proposed doing glass houses in you know, a slum section of a city and there the image that is brought up is not, oh, it's so wonderful to have this beautiful view of the sunrise, but this is a way that we can monitor your every move, your every breakfast and everything. So um, I think these issues around um, <coughs> privacy and privilege span both the architectural world, they certainly span the online world, and they come back a lot to the question of who's watching us because online in particular, a lot of who's watching us is marketers and people for whom, who are trying to get people to consume 
And so it's a protection against um, that type of persuasion that is also very hard to achieve if you don't have the money to be doing things without having everything be supported by advertising. So there's, a, I think, an enormous tension in all these worlds around money and privilege. And I think a lot of the questions that come up tend to be about protecting um, those whose way of being is not part of the mainstream in whatever culture they live in. And I think it's important to broaden it to saying that it's anyone who cannot afford to have some kind of retreat into privacy, which becomes increasingly expensive. Oh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Answer it. But I want to sort of underscore and thank you for for bringing it up, it's especially actually because of the the stunned silence that followed the woman right behind you um, raising her question earlier was was very telling. But I, what I wanted to do was link it actually to the conversation that was going on earlier, also about fear and opportunity, because it did strike me notably in the exam all the examples that came up around that. The fears were associated with the potential privacy invasions to potentially. Um, Minor, minority groups and groups who might be discriminated against. And I was also, you know, talking about about you know, um, uh, gays, HIV sufferers, other for other um, people suffering from other kinds of disease. I was actually thinking of an example myself where I've done work with um, around uh, women shelters. And if you want to think about the issues about knowing where you are uh, um, for uh, for for people who's um, for where the where publicity is not necessarily the right solution. Um, and so I think a lot of that discussion about fear and opportunity is actually a privileged discussion. And so I, I, so I just want to sort of underscore that and link those link those conversations together again. Yeah, I also thank you for bringing it up because I was about to to and saw it on Twitter and people felt it wasn't being brought up. Yeah, I, I guess I'm looking at this. I think in three, and that'll be wrong. It'll be four or five by the time I'm done. But the three areas. One is the notion of safety. That I have a lot more safety to be open than someone who is in a, uh, a underprivileged or different environment. So I think, I think safety is one of the issues. The second is the economic issue, and I think Harry's right here, but I see the economic in two ways. One is, uh, it's the entrepreneur Sam Lesson, who just got acquired by Facebook, who said this, not me. So if you tweet it, give him credit, uh, which is that privacy used to be ridiculously expensive, and uh, ridiculously inexpensive, and publicity used to be ridiculously expensive. And now it's reversed, right? That uh, the effort we have to go through to get privacy uh, takes more uh, more effort in all kinds of ways. Some economic, we have to you know cost, but some just time and effort and knowledge and and so on. Uh, whereas publicity, you had to either be Oprah or do something so outrageous that Oprah would have you on her show, and so that was made publicity expensive. And now we can all be public, and but to be private is harder. So that's an economic thing to the to the effort it takes. But the other economic part of the privilege, I think, that, that, that I just heard, is that if you are privileged, your information is more valuable to a marketer, right? So the irony there is that if you're privileged, it may be easier for you to get privacy, but if you're privileged, you may have to fight harder for your privacy because you're more valuable because you'll buy more stuff, you know? And so I think it'd be very interesting to look at privacy against these economic scales in some way putting aside, as stipulated, the safety questions that the impact of what society you are in and who you are in that society matters as a matter of privilege, but then the economic privilege alone is fascinating because I think it's more quantifiable. So can, while well, well, we send the microphone back there, maybe I can just ask one question on the privilege point. I'm, just, I'm thinking back to sort of years and years ago when people used to talk about the digital divide and then mercifully moved on to recognize that it was not just about access to the technology, but you actually need the skills uh, to use technology effectively. Um, and wondering whether this is, to some extent, just an extension of that, This is um, that it's another element of skill uh, to be un, uh, able to use technology effectively, to be able to protect your own privacy when you see fit, um, but that there's also, as opposed to the absence of being able to use technology, there's also an inherent danger, which is you need not even touch the technology, your privacy is at risk. So it's in some sense that um, that equation becoming a bit more complicated, but absolutely part of that same suite of issues that those who are least uh, privileged and underserved typically need and uh, merit that much more attention. And so. Uh, the question then to us as designers, whether as legal designers or technology designers um, or otherwise, is to think about how do we design solutions for those communities. Back there. Um, that was 
very much my question was just about uh, time and effort as well and that um, it requires me the time to be able to read several articles online to de determine how to protect my Facebook account um, and that not everyone has the same access to that information nor knows how to how to get it which is um, a problem I would pose to Negroponte if he's still in the room um, how these children learn to use computers um, which in my experience are not particularly intuitive um, but yeah I'm gonna pass this to him because you answered okay um, I just step out for a bit, so I apologize if this was addressed earlier, and we've kind of been grazing on it a little bit here. Um, but one of the points just mentioned, actually, um, about how we have this reversal of how publicity has become expensive and um, privacy expensive, I feel like it has some really interesting um, implications that we didn't go in as in depth on in terms of um, transparency and that's and that impact on accessibility of information, um, and what actually kind of um, raise that question in my mind is when we were talking about these glass buildings, I remember that I had been talking to someone who at the European Parliament, they said the building's designed out of glass because it's supposed to be transparent and you can just log on and find all this information about it. Um, but during that same time, um, there was a speech by the Vice President um, for the Commission, Vivian Redding, where she talked about how you have so much information and so much transparency and like so much like very easy publicity that it's it's almost counterintuitively making it harder for the average person logging on to get an effective idea of information. And uh, it'd be kind of nice to see a little bit um, more covered on the issue because when you have anyone can basically throw up their ideas on the internet um, and it's become so cheap for to obtain the publicity, I feel like it's almost like a deluge of information and we haven't really adjusted completely on how we deal with that, I feel like. So part of that's about filtering information, which is sort of maybe not so not as related to the public-private stuff. But then another part, um, perhaps, uh, it brings up a question for me, I guess, earlier uh, from today from Beatrice, is her statement that we become accustomed to the affordances of technology over time and wondering whether as these conceptions of privacy change, oh, sorry, one to you, um, whether we're just going to, we just sort of give up and we're okay with the fact that we're living this, these hyper-public lives. Sure, I just wanted to return to the question of um, working with underserved or also under-resourced communities and thinking of design questions that would inform, you know, helping people through these questions of privacy or protection, protecting themselves, remaining anonymous. And going to the example of the women's shelters or also HIV, it was really in that moment where, you know, folks who experience violence or HIV, those were the folks who designed women's shelters and healthcare clinics to serve those communities, the people who were most impacted and most at risk. They by facing that risk, we're actually really expert in navigating really dangerous situations. And so I would just kind of flip that question and say, how can you actually take those people who are under-resourced and underprivileged, who are experiencing great risk, and put them in the center of really tapping their expertise, working together with designers and engineers to handle some of these questions? Mm -hmm. There's a whole bunch of, we have two down here and then a couple more okay. in the middle, um, one in the back. And I believe we are heading towards final minutes. Yeah, so these so, have to be kind of tweet length. So, okay, uh, tweet length. Sorry, uh, <laughs> So, all right, so responding to your question, yes, the change in uh, notions of privacy are hugely uh, important. I mean, for example, looking at the x-ray of the, of the woman that I saw, for, at, at that time, I mean, looking at it now, we will be concerned about maybe two things. One will be radiation and the other will be privacy, right? Do I have the beginning of tuberculosis? Do I want anybody to know about, about this? So the question of privilege is hugely important. If I'm healthy, it's, it's no problem, right? I can send the picture to, to my boyfriend. But if not, it's, it's a real problem. But the interesting thing is that in that moment, that is not of their, their concern at all. The fear of the of the X-rays and the fear of living in the in the glass house has nothing to do with the preoccupations that we have today. So in 50 years, we have changed entirely our understanding of what privacy is, and this is one thing that I think we should insist more. Uh, and I have seen in this conference, which is of, of course been fascinating, but there is absolutely constantly projection of what we understand privacy today not only to in, into the last century, but into the, hist into the history of humanity, when in fact continuously uh, uh, change, right? So the fear is nothing, it's, it, it's nothing to do with what we have. It's the fear of the exposure, 
the exposure of what was invisible before, something that for us is now completely uh, 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 normal. And I'm not so sure about what tweet you were saying. This has got to be okay. tweet-like, because there's other right. people, I'm sorry to I be rude. But <laughs> I just wanted to um, add, you, you asked what you would like to hear in addition to what was covered. Um, I would have liked to have heard more of a discussion about how um, our digital culture is changing our relationship with ourself and how that self becomes a new reflection, a new privacy, a new public, and really that's an enormous topic which I felt was not addressed at all. No, uh, actually, I, I, I agree with you. Oh, David, something I'm pretty Zainab interested in. One, one, I'm sorry, what are you saying? Zainab one, one, two. No? Okay. Nope. Um, we're going to favor people who have not yet spoken, even though you may be out of turn in the order of hands. Um, well, this is something that wasn't discussed, but I missed the first session because um, I was on the train from New York, so I hope it wasn't discuss discussed. But um, one thing I was hoping to hear more about is uh, more the, the global, um, the glo global hyper-public. I feel like every time we talk about um, this on the international stage, it's, you know, the, th the free world versus repressive regimes. Um, and I thought that Ethan's point about um, websites needing to have an English version was a really important one. But I'd love to kind of engage more with the European approach to privacy and, you know, how, um, how we are shaping the hyperpublic versus how Europe is and how we're influencing one another. Anyone who hasn't, who hasn't spoken especially? On your left, David? Left, left, ah. or there? <laughs> okay. I actually didn't see whose hand was up. Ah. I'm uh, Joshua Coffin from the Graduate School of Design. Tweet length is um, uh, my concern, uh, and the question I think we should be addressing also is that, the, um, that through the erosion of privacy, our personal data is becoming privatized, and we need to discuss those terms of exchange um, from a commercial and social standpoint. And one over here, and then we'll add perhaps just a minute what? after our appointed God, time. You let, me, let me just <laughs> move. You know I'm going. Come on. Man, I got a bike home. <laughs> Thank you. Hi. Um, and I think this was discussed um, implicitly in a lot of things, especially when we started out the conversation with Street View. Um, so something maybe more about the place of physical place, the place of location in considerations of surveillance and the audiences that we consent to when we walk out onto the street, you know, when we were talking about the sort of informed consent or uninformed consent. So the consideration of the online audience, but also sort of the physical audience and the physical context that we find ourselves in when we're considering um, how privacy or surveillance might affect our actions or interactions. So uh, as everyone straightens up their seat backs and uh, <laughs> puts their tray tables up and Judith and Jeff, I think, are going to come up and just give us a final word to bring us in for a landing, I um, want to just, uh, uh, on behalf of the folks at the Berkman Center, offer you all a huge thanks uh, for coming here today. This was uh, really interesting for me personally. Everyone was asking, you know, what's going to happen? What's it going to be like? And I said, you know, I have no idea. I know it's going to be good because there are amazing people here. Um, and we had an interesting program set up, but I had no idea what it was going to be. And I just, I really, I can't thank you enough from each of your different dis disciplines and perspectives for diving in, in this kind of creative and engaging and open way. And I think for, to do that in one day where you're kind of crossing so many boundaries and come this far, which is not to say we have answers, but better sense of the questions was really pretty remarkable. So thank you. And with that, Judith and Jeff, please. So thank you all very much. Um, so many people had, I mean, it, one of the great things about a conference like this is that the audience and the speakers really blend together. And both for the speakers and the audience, I'd really urge you, so many people mentioned things they'd read, whether it's song lyrics, papers they'd written, things that they thought were incredibly stupidly said and they wanted to critique them. We have a wiki here, and I hope that one of the outcomes that we can have from this conference is an ongoing dialogue. So I would urge you all, I think we've all had enough talking in this room for today, but I'd urge you to continue the dialogue, whether it's over drinks and dinner later, out in the sunshine, or permanently or semi-permanently online to have this be a start of the discussion, not the end of it. Thank you.